welcome to the Nerd Party. Hi, this is Henry Gilroy, co-executive producer of Star Wars Rebels. You're listening to Aggressive Negotiations. Welcome to Aggressive Negotiations, a Star Wars podcast here on the Nerd Party Network. Coming at you from the Aki Aki Festival of the Ancestors here on Pasana in the Forbidden Valley. It is wonderful to be here. Wait, John, I, I feel like I'm on Jeddah. You feel like you're on Jeddah? Am I getting my planets mixed up? Well, uh, let me ask you, um, I know that you see the festival going on. Is there a big hole where a city used to be? Mm, I don't see a big hole. Then we're on Pasana. So, it's okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's fine. It's fine. I just was, I wasn't sure if the calculations got misdone yep. or, you know, like something like that. Well, some some snafu had happened. When, when we were light speed skipping the way that we were and we went to <laughs> zany places for two seconds or less, you know, you can get Jetta and Pasana mixed up that way. Sure. So, so true. true. So yeah. true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we're excited to be back with you this week. We are going to be diving into the extras, uh, as we like to do, uh, for the home release of The Rise of Skywalker. And uh, before we do that, John, I uh, just want to remind everybody that you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, if you're over on Apple Podcasts, give us a star rating review because we're doing that review contest right now. Uh, for USA residents, uh, and you can win a copy of The Art of Star Wars, The Clone Wars, which is a really cool book. I'm so excited to give this away to somebody. And we actually have two new reviews. Um, now, uh, the first review that we have comes from a wonderful reviewer. I just love their name. It's called Diner Kenobi, which is hilarious. Yeah, I love it. Uh, and so you know they're hanging out at Dex's on the, all, the, all the time. How could you not? And... Five stars, it says, heroes on both sides. War! The Star Wars fandom is crumbling under attacks from endless debates over Disney Star Wars. There are heroes on both sides. Negativity is everywhere. In a stunning move, the fiendish internet debates have swept into the heart of the fandom and captured the warm feelings Star Wars once brought into our hearts. As the hive of hate and negativity attempts to flee with the warm feelings of our hearts, two Jedi Knights, Master Matthew Rushing and Master John Mills, lead a desperate mission to rescue the captive fandom with the power of positivity. Now that is just a fantastically funny and well thought out review. Just bravo, yes, my friend. Bravo, bravo golf Diner. Clap, golf clap. Uh, I- extremely clever. Uh, I actually made both of us chuckle when we read it. Well done. It well did. done, <laughs> Diner Kenobi. Thank you for that review. We, uh, we're we glad, you know, as usual, we're glad that you, you see sort of like what our mission statement is here. And uh, actually writing it to mimic the title crawl of Revenge of the Sith, which is my favorite of the entire saga, it just warms my heart even more. But speaking of warm feelings, Sean Wanty left a five-star review for us titled, A Refreshing and Therapeutic Show in These Jaded Times. Now, I'm not going to read the whole review, so we're, we're going to hit sort of some high notes here. And one of the things I wanted to highlight from the review was... I don't really get to have these sorts of deep conversations, not two-way ones anyways, about Star Wars with anyone other than my wife. People, even friends who have been longtime fans, either seem to not have the patience for the depth of conversation I prefer or are just being far too polite, especially when talking about the more controversial parts of the series. But both Matt and John have been exemplary toward me in this regard, showing the kind of conversational depth I've been looking for. Now, that right there is incredibly meaningful uh, because we do try to strive for those conversations that we all like to have but sometimes can't really have in the comfort of, you know, polite society. I've, I've actually been scolded by uh, my lovely wife because I will start to go down that rabbit hole and she notices people at Christmas parties or something like that have their eyes start to glaze over and they're being far too polite to disengage from the conversation because they see how animated and you know interested in the topic that I am. So if we're bringing that to people then yeah, that's really cool. And and I really you know love that uh you know Sean has keyed in on that. Uh one fun 
note that uh, Sean has in his review that I, that I want to share here is, uh, if I had one complaint, though, it would be this. The episodes are too short, except when they have the amazing interviews with Gilroy or Anastasio. I consistently get into the episodes the most right before they sign off. Terrible. Now, that's cheeky, and I love it. And you know what? What we're always striving for is to give you just enough. Always leave the audience wanting more so that you keep coming back every week. But as you know, whenever we come up on special anniversary episodes or special milestone numbers, you know you're going to get commentaries from us. And uh, with, uh, with the lockdowns happening right now, you know, maybe we're brainstorming some commentaries in the background that you're going you're gonna to enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I uh, just wanted to say thank you so much to Sean. Uh, you know, that review meant a lot to John and I to get. And, uh, you know, I, our goal has always just to been to have as much fun as we can talking about this stuff, uh, be critical when necessary, but do it in a way that's respectful. And, uh, you know, uh, gosh, with the emails that we have gotten from this this uh, gentleman, John, I really think Sean should start his own Star Wars blog because uh, he definitely has a way with words and writing. So I would highly encourage that because I think everybody could benefit from the things that he's thinking about, not just us, oh, yeah. which we've been uh, an amazing recipients of. So, um, you know, it, thank you so much for everybody who's been doing this for, for us because obviously it helps the show. Uh, actually, you know, as we've been getting these reviews, our, our numbers have actually upticked a little bit. So we want to say a huge thank you because your 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 effort is not just, you know, to get a review so you can maybe win the book, but you actually are helping our show and you're making a difference with people finding it. So continue to do this for us. If you haven't ever given us a review, hop on there. It doesn't have to be something that's long-winded or anything. Um, honestly, every little review helps us find more people uh, and help more people find the show. So uh, we really appreciate that. You can find us also on Twitter, at the Jedi Masters. That's our show account where you can follow us. We love interacting with people over there. You've got the entire network on at Join Nerd Party. We've got the nerdparty.com where you can find all the shows we're doing. You can go to the contact section on the nerdparty.com where you can send us an email like Sean has. Uh, we love getting emails. We love interacting with listeners that way. Uh, and then, of course, we're on Facebook at facebook.com slash the nerd party where uh, you can also interact with us there. As you know, we post the shows each week, which is a lot of fun. Uh, it's a great place to interact with us. And of course, we're even on Instagram at the Nerd Party. So, all of those places, we would love for you to follow us and, and like us and subscribe and all those things that you do there on social media. And, you know, right now, as you know, we are having a lot more time. It's the perfect time to interact, you know, uh, and the way social media was kind of meant for. So we really appreciate to everybody who's been uh, helping our days pass because you've inter been interacting with us. Uh, so, John, we've talked about uh, all of the extras that we've gotten uh, throughout, especially, you know, Disney Star Wars, quote unquote. Uh, and, you know, some of the releases we've been more uh, excited than than others, uh, so, you know, I just wanted to kind of start overarching, you know, as you compare this with the other releases that we've gotten from Disney Star Wars, how does this one rank, do you think? Uh, because, you know, we've got a two hour documentary on there, the the Skywalker Legacy. We've got some of the other documentaries there. There's the Maestro's Final. Uh, we were actually able to find, thank you, YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, the documentary that only came on uh, the Target edition, uh, which was called The Final Alliance. Uh, so, with all of these extras, um, how has this extras lineup ranked for you? Without speaking to the quality, but more to the quantity, this is a further indication that Lucasfilm in the era of Disney has course corrected because the greatest complaint that we had with Force Awakens uh, and Rogue One even were, where are the extras? We are used to having a master class in filmmaking with these releases, with new documentaries and in-depth deep dive sorts of things. And so it's this is, I think, exactly what should be done. This is this is perfect. It, this gave all of these things are key toward the idea of giving a really in-depth examination of not just the filmmaking process, but the thinking behind 
why certain choices were made, how certain choices were arrived at, what compromises were made, and those sorts of things. And as a result, I'm, I'm happy with the amount of extras that they had on here. I, I, I suspect you are too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, to me, you know, anytime you're going to get a massive documentary about the making of a film on, uh, you know, the extras disc, and it's two hours. I mean, it's it's a little over two hours long. Mm-hmm. So to me, that's fantastic, especially since personally, you know, my favorite extras come from the Lord of the Rings series. Uh, uh, so, you know, you've got three hour docs on each of those extended cuts. And then on The Hobbit, there are nine hours. So, I mean, it's the most extensive you can get. And so I think, like you said, absolutely, it seems like Disney kind of is course correcting here with Lucasfilm because, heck, we're going to be getting soon a documentary series about The Mandalorian mm-hmm. coming out. And it's a eight episode series so it's basically like getting a documentary for each episode Mm -hmm. so i think in many ways disney is seeing the validity of showing us the behind the scenes because fans love this kind of stuff and i think maybe maybe they're just being less precious with it in the same way that lucas was like you know when you think about lucas's documentary for uh, the the Phantom Menace, which I, I still think is kind of the benchmark, that and Empire of Dreams uh, from the DVD series that came out where they did the entire uh, original trilogy. Those two documentaries were just so well done. And I, I think um, I would personally, uh, next to those two, I would put the Skywalker Legacy documentary series that they did here that's two hours. I think... It's it's uh it's good. It's informative. It's fun. It gives you a great opportunity to spend some time with with the behind the scenes people, not just from the actors and directors, but then other people involved. Like you know, getting time to spend with Chris Terrio, I thought was fascinating, mm-hmm. uh, since he helps JJ write the movie. Um, and uh, I always love kind of seeing how they actually do certain scenes and they they did that really well showing us how to actually they, you know especially like in Pasana and things like that you know so um and this is because the art of star wars the rise of skywalker didn't really have much from the end of the movie this is the only place really where they showed us a more extensive look at uh the art for the end of the mm-hmm. movie which you know with exegol and and the behind the scenes look at that stuff so you know all in all i think it's um i would say it's pretty strong yeah i if if i were to offer any criticism of that documentary and uh, you know please take this as you know just me being me sort of thing as usual uh i think there was a little bit too much focus on showing clips from the past it Mm -hmm. it sort of played i and i don't i don't know if this is an emotional moment for me beyond an intellectual one but it sort of reminded me how in a sense a lot of what was done with the sequel trilogy is a bit over reliant on the original trilogy up to and including when they talk about the design for the death star destroyers how they said, oh, well, we just grabbed a model from Rogue One and then we repainted it and we put a gun on the bottom. That sort of thing, I think, is extremely candid in an uh, unintentional way because as somebody who has a fetish for the new ship designs, when I see that, and even when I look at the the art of the force awakens book. And I see all of the, the, the different looking designs that they had for star destroyers that they were considering. And instead it was just, it's a bigger star destroyer. That sort of thing is always going to be something that, that grates on me right now. They included it though. So it's not like they tried to dress it up. They just showed the process. So I at least understood and appreciated the process. I might not agree with what their goal was, but okay. And yeah, seeing that they said, well, for, the Sith throne, we went back to a pencil sketch that Macquarie did, and we built on that. Okay, that's val. You know, I like seeing that sort of thing. But I think that the overall flaw of the documentary is that they kept interjecting these moments from 
interviews for The Empire Strikes Back and Star Wars and Return of the Jedi that were hearkening back. And I get that the overarching goal is to emphasize the theme that this is wrapping up nine films. But at the same time, I'm watching this documentary because I want to learn about this film, not about those which I've seen just about everything on up to this point, because there wasn't really anything right. newly re- revelatory about the originals that they, they referenced. Do you, I mean, you get where I'm going with that, right? No, absolutely. And I 100% agree with you. Uh, you know, I... I actually am right there with you. I think they were over reliant on that, and I think if you're going to do that, then you probably should have uh, done your research into the prequels mm-hmm. and used that material as well uh, to because there was an end there. So this idea of like coming to an end, I think there's another end that you you didn't even reference really, and there's. Um, there's a lack of respect there, I think, for the the prequels uh, in some ways, um, because you didn't go back and, and research and, and find the interviews that you could have done with, you know, uh, gosh, anything you interject from McGregor is probably going to be gold. Mm-hmm. Anything from Lucas at that point would be interesting. Uh, you know, I love that they had Lucas in here talking about his the making of Star Wars and that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, but I, Hayden Christensen, all these type of people like. They were a part of an end as mm-hmm. well. And the, the the problem I found with the insertion of this material is that sometimes, and, and this is just to be completely honest, it reinforces the perfection of the end mm-hmm. of The Return of the Jedi mm-hmm. and juxtaposes that with this. And everybody knows I like The Rise of Skywalker, but... I think that this actually hurts itself by using this material instead of maybe just trying to stand on its own. I I agree. I I think that where I picked up a little bit of shade thrown at the prequels was uh, somebody had a a, a throwaway line where they said, and that's why we do it practically. And I think it would have been much more interesting to have that prequel stuff brought in the the behind-the-scenes stuff there, simply to have the production crew, or even Abrams himself, say something. Like, I would have even found a way to spin it in such a way. I would love to get him on record to say something like, I didn't think that was as successful a visual effect as it could have been, and that's why we wanted to combine practical and CG for this thing. I don't even understand, having watched the documentary, I don't even completely understand why we had to move from a CG Maz in The Force Awakens to puppet Maz. Yeah. Nobody yeah, explained that thinking to that me either. because it seems to me unnecessary because they'd already created a Maz that I believed in and enjoyed and was real. And mm-hmm. then they turn around and they say, but we'll build a puppet. And it's... Right. I, you know, like, it just... It just seems arbitrary, and I know it wasn't. It couldn't mm-hmm. have been. You reference about right. you know Terrio talking, and Terrio obviously has it all in his head about okay, we're referencing this, we're talking about this, and this combines with this. And he's talking about all of those themes, so you know that there wasn't an arbitrary decision about these things. If you're going to show me the construction of the big, what's his name, the the big slug creature in the Falcon, oh Bob, oh Claude, Claude. yeah, right. Then explain to me why you did Puppet Maz. It's only fair. And, you know, I, right, I'm not trying to right. fixate on it, but, you know. Yeah. No, no, I get what you're saying it completely because that's another thing that didn't quite make sense to me. Um, I did love that we got J.J. saying in, in the documentary that his favorite scene for the prequels is the opera house, mm-hmm. you know, which I think is really cool. Um, you know, and, and so I, I think – it it does and and obviously you know JJ has a love for that because it is the very basis for the return of Palpatine so he has a respect for that as well which I I thought was really nice to see and what is especially funny because of the emphasis on the practical stuff is that took place at an opera house because they didn't build a yeah. big set and they said this shouldn't just be in his office what could we do that's interesting. And they just threw it that, okay, everybody get in this blue box here and we're going to make this an opera house. And everybody adores that scene. It's just further evidence that it doesn't really matter the technology that you use so long as people are digging what's going on. And 
from th- this is a really weird tangent, but it's again, it's me being me. Uh, Kathleen Kennedy has a comment at one point where she says, "Oh, what a shame that we have to tear all of this down." And that's that's one of those things that like sort of grates on me in a sense from an environmental perspective of well, digital f- filmmaking makes even more sense then because you're not creating this giant blockade runner set piece just to tear it down three weeks later. You and you're not building the entire encampment in Pasana. You build a couple of tents and then you duplicate it. And it's not just a speed process thing. It's a sensible environmental thing because you're leaving less of a footprint by by doing that. And yeah, absolutely. I, know, I know it's a weird thing for me to fixate on, but I do. No, I think, you know, I, I do think that that's a great thought, though, when when we think about, you know, the, especially the way the Mandalorian's done, right, mm-hmm. where they have sets, but then everything else is a digital extension. And part of that allows them to be able to film on a, on a much tighter budget. Um, but it is much more environmentally friendly, you know, uh, and, and I think, you know, as, as we're all looking to be good stewards of the planet that we have, um, you know, building massive sets that, that, I mean, you know, look, lumber is a renewable resource, right? But, it, you know, with the, the, I get what you're saying, and I think it, it makes a lot of sense. And then it, it is sad that you would, like, build that blockade runner and that it's not, like, sitting at a Disney park somewhere. Right? You know, like, it's like, p- transport that sucker over to, you know, Disney World. Completely agree. Why? Especially now. You see the, the animatronic Maz that was made. Well, we have an animatronic Hondo. Mm-hmm. Why not find a way to work animatronic Maz into Galaxy's Edge? Right. Have her, yeah. have her, you know, standing up working on something, you know, on the rooftop or something like that, bemoaning, yeah, you know, how, how she's a thousand years old and she can't believe that they can't fix this yet. You know, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So I had a question for you uh, because this is something that I – so I got a chance to watch the documentary. I've, I've seen it twice now because I, I watched it when I first got the uh, – you know, I cracked open the box set and then got a chance to watch it again before we recorded. And and so one of the big things we learned about uh, and they really talk about in depth, which I liked, was their thought process is that, that they had – they felt like they had to bring Carrie back for this mm-hmm. film. And that obviously they are having to write the entire movie – basically around the scenes that they have for Carrie. And, you know, I know sometimes that for filmmaking that the um, having less options is actually better because it makes you think really hard about mm-hmm. things. But I'm, I wanted to ask you, do you think, do you think that maybe possibly they undercut being able to do something even bigger and grander because they had tied themselves to this one idea. I think that yes. I think that I'm not particularly critical of it because I think they were in a rock and a hard place. Because sure, sure. there are two ways to deal with her death. Have her killed in the beginning and have everybody unhappy. Or bring her back and mold everything around it and have people be maybe a little dissatisfied with the limitations it put in as opposed to ignoring the character because that right. in terms of the larger story arc that would that would stand out more i think i mm-hmm. what i enjoyed in this documentary and something i hadn't really thought of was that i'm fairly certain it's terio that says this that this is leia's jedi trial this yeah, is where yeah. she completes the journey to Jedi, and I hadn't really thought of it from that perspective. So whenever I do get around to watching the film again, I'll be looking at it through that lens, and I'll think to myself, okay, so that's why that flashback scene now suddenly becomes more important, because we see that she's on the verge of becoming a Jedi and walks away when she never should have. And that gives me a little bit more to hold on to and a little bit more to work with intellectually. Right. So. I, I mean, I think that if there's if there's a darn shame, it's that there isn't a split off featurette of just Terrio's interviews to talk about the construction of the script, because I think that especially with what you're talking about, how they had we have these little snippets, we have to build a script around it. I'd love to learn more about that from a technical standpoint. 
How did how did he feel about that? Does he think it it was a limitation? Is there something he wished he could have done but he couldn't because of this limitation? And uh, you know, at at the same time, what was interesting was regardless of how I feel about that much of the Death Star being intact and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that fight is really cool. Where 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 yeah. Ray and yep. and Ben fight with the waves going on. And what was interesting to me was the entire crew said, oh, it's so interesting. We've got the, the water splashing. We've got all of this stuff going on, and it's new and different. And nobody sat there and said a thing that I enjoy about it is it's a complete counterbalance to fighting on a lava planet. It's, yep. it's Obi-Wan and Anakin all over again, but with a different outcome. And the emphasis of the, the water waves versus the lava waves coming over, I would have loved to hear somebody speak about that. And to hear yeah. to hear nobody yeah. say it makes me it fills me with a little bit of regret because now I'm sitting here saying oh, okay well that's just my own read which is fine we all build head cannon and stuff but I enjoy it more when the filmmaker said I purposely did that as opposed to me layering it on it does seem like that it would be something too that if if you had had a more interviews with Terry that you, that probably would have come probably. out because I cannot imagine uh you know that that wasn't part of his thought process because listening to him in the conversations like he's he's very knowledgeable about all of Star Wars prequels original trilogy and what they've done in the sequels he he tend and you can see the thought but like you were talking about like that idea of like Leia you know he really connected with that idea of that we never truly got to explore the idea there is another. Uh, and so the, the whole idea of her training Rey, you know, and they connected that with the end of The uh, the uh, Last Jedi of her saying we have everything we need. So that, yes, Luke may be, you know, Force Ghost Luke now, but I can still continue. Like, we have what we need to continue your training. Like, uh, and I thought that that was a really interesting thought process that they were they were specifically – working to make this fit but also to really build the story of of leia in a way that you know the eu doesn't have leia become a jedi till much later Mm -hmm. you know she kind of gives up her jedi training for a very long time to be in politics and then she finally becomes one and this one you know we get to really see that play out um in her training ray and and so i think that was something that was really uh, they again this is something they talk a lot about in the documentary, which I liked because it's a big part of the whole story. So I thought that was really cool. Yes. And I, I think that there are some tremendous opportunities that they've opened up to round it out and support it with other material, which everybody loves when they do that. It, you know, Bloodline greatly Im- improved uh, the, the story behind uh, The Force Awakens. And gave a lot more shape to the world. And I I think that at the very least, regardless of where you land with the film, there are at least footholds and handholds for people to come on and grapple with some of this and turn it into a thing. Uh, Something I did find interesting in the documentary, though, was something that Adam Driver said when he talks about, spoilers, Han Solo coming back and talking to him and then reenacting that scene from The Force Awakens. And he says, I think this is something that's probably played in his head. I'm with him. And he says, for a number of years. And I think to myself, well, the timeline's about a year. Okay. I mean, like it, that sort of thing, I think sort of accidentally is just like a little pinprick on me of if only they'd established the timeline was a little bit longer. It, right. it would have been so much better. I, and but again, that's Monday morning quarterbacking, and I'm not talking about criticism of the film in, in specific or anything. But I, of the actors, everybody was a joy to listen to in their behind the scenes interviews. I loved hearing from Ridley. I loved hearing from Boyega. I loved hearing from Isaac. But I was really intrigued by Driver because he really seems to have this intensity. And the stunt coordinator specifically calling out that he was, I, I'm trying to use just the right word here. I think she said possessive 
of his physicality that she said, well, we'll get a stunt man. And he said, no, I'm doing everything. Like he, for him, it wasn't even an option not to do things because he owns that character. And I love seeing that sort of dedication from an actor. Well, and and it's so funny because the difference is because, you know, you juxtapose that with scenes with Daisy where she's talking about the uh, fight in his quarters and then the, and the one that transitions to Kajimi. Uh, And so And she was thinking to herself, oh, well, there'll be scenes that I don't have to do. I mean, there'll be parts of this fight I don't have to do. And then, of course, she had to do them, you know. And so it's just the difference in thought process. And I agree with you completely. One of the things I really love about Adam Driver, and I've seen it in some some behind-the-scenes videos for him for other things, is that he is so involved with that whatever character he's playing it doesn't matter what character it is he has put it the thought he's put in the time he's trying to put himself in the headspace he is trying to be that character for you and he's just that type of actor and i really appreciate that dedication to him uh you know uh for him and it was just it was fun you know to get into his head i would if there could have been more for with driver I would have loved it because he's just fascinating to listen to because he truly has inhabited the thought process of who this character is and the why of this character. Mm -hmm. And this is going to sound funny, but I also enjoyed seeing behind the scenes stuff of him taking his helmet on and off and realizing that on set it really is just sort of like a... A, a Halloween costume helmet, like it, it has, su- it yeah. seems to have such weight on screen, and they've established, you know, how how it works and everything like that. But he's just popping yeah. it on and off like a kid at Halloween. I love that. Well, and and that mask thing is really cool too because they they, they use, and I don't know the actual term, and they didn't mention it in the documentary, and I did not get a chance to look it up. But they talk about you know the the Japanese idea of taking something that's broken mm-hmm. and that you put it back together, and you have the gold filament that that puts it back together, so you can always tell that that thing was broken, but that it's been put back together. So they do that with the helmet, but instead of it being gold, they do you know obviously the red, and so the fact that you have. This character who, you know, Driver describes as being so sure of himself at the beginning and and diving deeper in the dark side, but yet the visual representation of the cracks in the mask that the cracks are literally showing now, uh, it, and, and but they're in red. Like, I, I thought that made it so much more um, interesting to me, the idea that we brought the mask back because it has such a thought process behind it and the why it looks the way it does. And it it is a great representation of kind of the, um, a character who thinks that they're actually becoming more sure of themselves, but what's really happening is that they are becoming more fissured. You yeah. know, like there's, there's, there's more... There's more shattering that's actually taking place inside until he finally completely shatters, you know, on that Death Star uh, battle where he is brought to a halt by, you know, his mother. So. And what's really interesting, too, uh, you know, so, so long as we're talking about this, is what was not gone into great depth in the documentary that I found surprising was I thought this would have been a terrific opportunity for them to do a super deep dive on the Knights of Ren and provide right. some more shading on that. And instead kind of absent. And it, it, that was, that was yeah. odd for me <laughs> because so much was made about them. He's a, he's the Lord master of the Knights of Ren. It's like, Oh, what, what is this? I still don't know. Okay. All right. That's, that's cool. That's cool. Uh, yeah. They actually left that for a comic book. Yeah. I, so. well, I know, but it would have been, no, I know, you know what you're saying, though. It would have been, would have been cool to finally. Um, you know, I, so one of the things that really stood out to me, too, is the the short bit. And, and unfortunately, Mark Hamill is not really in the documentary all that much. Yeah. Um, but I really love the – it was really telling. And I thought it was really beautiful for Daisy to say that she thought that it was probably nice for Mark to be more like the Luke Skywalker of old. Mm-hmm. And to finally get to be that character. Um, and, you know, you even had Terrio say that, you know, he loved the idea that even though Luke was gone, that he was continuing to actually help train the next generation of Jedi. Mm-hmm. 
And you know, there's something really special about that for everybody who was a little frustrated with the Luke that we got in The Last Jedi, that this is something that was at least in their minds, um, and at least actor-wise, definitely uh, in their minds. And, and you know, I, I think it makes it sense. Um, and so I, I, I actually would have loved to have had Mark be in it in a little bit more, but obviously, too, it's not really his movie. Yeah, you know, this this really is the movie. This is this is truly the movie where this cast really gets to be the Star Wars cast without having to rely so much on you know uh, the legacy characters. They're they're kind of carrying this film, and so it was fun to see their enjoyment and their incitement of doing that. Um, the fun that they had together, the, you know, obviously they've known each other for six years now, so it seems like they have a blast together, and I think that's always fun to see. And I think that chemistry really comes off on screen mm-hmm. so that even though, you know, like that moment at the very end where they hug each other, you know, and we know intellectually that they've only known each other for about a year, year and a half, right? But they've known each other for six years, and so the chemistry of that scene play so much more impactfully Mm -hmm. because of the way that these people relate to each other on a whole other level. And I think that's something that um, really helps the movie in those moments where they're overcoming some of the shortcomings of the sequel trilogy. But these actors were able to, I think, do that. And and this behind-the-scenes material, especially in this... uh, Really, I think uh, they they help bring that even more to life. So I think this the Skywalker legacy uh, extra here is is a a real benefit. I would say this: you want your extra to be a benefit to the film, mm-hmm. right? And I think this definitely benefits the film because, like you were saying, you find these little tidbits that, as you watch the movie, kind of make it come alive in a different way for you, or make you think of something new and. And that's what you want and the extras to do, right? And and so that's really good. I, I give them a lot of props for for being able to pull that out of their hat with this one. I did find it interesting that we got a lot of deleted scenes in The Last Jedi. We got a couple of deleted scenes in The Force Awakens, but not really entering that territory with uh, with the rise of Skywalker. I, I and the thing is, I. You know, with all of those rumors that were flying around, and granted, they're just rumors, but there were these rumors flying around for the longest time. There's a three-hour Abrams cut. He was mad that they made him cut 30 minutes out. Like, there are so many rumors flying around that are obviously BS, <laughs> but or or they are magnified beyond what the actual truth is. Like, you know, maybe his cut was like six minutes longer or something. But it would have been interesting to get, get my hands on that stuff. I like the deleted scenes. I... A lot of a lot of our conversational uh, mileage from the last Jedi release was that those deleted scenes were on there, and we could actually talk very much about did it make sense to cut this? Would it have been better to have this in the film? Sort of thing. Yeah. So it's interesting you say that because, and one of the things we do want to do here on the show, and we hope to do, you know, as as soon as we can. It's been a crazy time for both of us, and and. Um, but uh, we want to talk through the the expanded uh, novelization, uh, and you know I'll spoil it here. But I think most of that material, if it had been in the film, would have been great. Uh, and so y- you can in- look forward to us uh, talking about that when, when we get mm-hmm. there. But those, I think, a lot of those extended scenes, um, uh, we have reference to that they they exist somewhere in script form, um, you know, things that they might not have used or whatever. Uh, so, you know, um, I would have loved to have maybe seen some of those scenes, uh, like you said, like we got with some of the other films uh, where you have extended scenes or actual, you know, cut scenes or whatever. Um, so absolutely, I, I think it would have been, you know, great to get some of that. Um, you know, I, I would say here, the other documentaries on this uh the main release that we get are are not bad. I think the Pasana Pursuit is actually the most interesting one because they really go in depth about what that was like to shoot in the desert. Um, the rest of the documentaries are not amazing, uh, honestly. Um, 
you know, Aliens in the Desert, Dio, Key to the Past, Warwick and Son, and cast of characters are only okay. Um, I think the best one that we get on the main release uh, next to the Skywalker Legacy is the uh, Maestro's final finale. The Maestro's finale. Yeah. And, you know, getting to spend time with John Williams is such a joy. And to really get into his thought process was so much fun. And he deserves to be celebrated as a massive part of the Star Wars galaxy. And I was really glad that they gave this to us as the uh, digital exclusive. Yep. Um, because not only does it, it does he get to talk about the choices he made... But we also just get to celebrate a man who has helped make Star Wars what it is. Yes. Star Wars doesn't exist without John Williams. Full stop. Even Lucas himself said the music is so key to everything. And it it carried that story forward and became a cultural phenomenon on its own. And I especially enjoyed in the Meisters finale that Williams himself talked about this is not an average opportunity to get to come back and continue working on a giant masterwork that spans 40 years. It's this, this is an abnormal sort of situation. And I love when he talks about the horn player who hit that top C when the, when the fanfare started in 77 and it was the guy's first day in the orchestra and just to to see him recount that, I never knew that story, that it was the guy's first day and he was apparently just full of energy. He was going to nail that note. And you just think about that note is patterned into so many brains at this point. I mean, we've talked about that note a lot. Yes, yes we have. <laughs> yes, we have. Because it's never been the nope. same. Not quite. <laughs> Not quite. Not quite at all. But yeah, you know, I, I mean, I, I do. I do enjoy that, uh, that, you know, Meister's finale. I, I love talking about the music. I love listening about the music. I actually wish, even though Anthony Daniels got a lot of attention in a similar fashion in the documentary, I would have liked to feature it with him as well to say, this is finally the end of 3PO's journey and get his, I, he's been very free with his insights. I remember in the, Star Wars Insider, how he had a column and he would share all of these tremendous uh, stories uh, from his experiences on set. And I just, I, you know, I would have liked a, a little, a little sort of treatment the way that Warwick Davis got and the way that John Williams got. I, it, and what's tough is we obviously can't get that with Carrie Fisher, but it would have been very, yeah. Interesting to get that one. It would have been very interesting to get Mark Hamill to have because if you're going to do something that's a retrospective on the entire thing, I I guess by this point they've all said everything they need to say. So I, I guess that's a fair counterpoint. Yeah, that's hard. Yeah, yeah that's definitely a, a tough thing to think about. Uh the other extra that um you know you only got if you got the target edition or you found it on YouTube like we were able to do is a final alliance. And I have to say it is a Dang shame that this was not on the uh, the the other editions because it's one of the best extras that they did. It's like twenty minutes long. Uh, it's a little over twenty minutes long, and I love seeing the the thought process behind like ships and like putting that together and and all of the things that they do CGI wise to make these movies work and and just. I mean, even the thought that, you know, when they had that massive fleet show up, right, that it's their, they, they call it their Dunkirk moment, um, and they thought, oh, we've got enough ships, and then they realized, no, we don't. So they had to create, I think they said 67 or something new ships just to fill the the, the space, like they, need, they needed more ships, and then not only that, but they mentioned all of the ships that are there, so like you've got uh, three of the aces from Resistance, which is really cool, you of course got the Ghost, yeah. you've got the U-Wing, the B-Wing, the A-Wing, the, they created new alphabet wings just because they needed, you know, more shit, like, it's, it's, you know that kind of stuff is to me just so much fun because it's it's literally moments that you have to really pause to get to in the first place but 
it's neat to see all the thought and care that goes into all of these type of things as much as they can possibly do in the time crunch that these guys have. Yes, and I think that it's you're you're talking about the fact that it's on the Target exclusive edition, so you have to track it down yeah. by a certain way. I hate the exclusive edition nonsense Me too. because it is a way to wring dollars and cents out of people because there are going to be people who are compulsive enough to go ahead and get the target edition plus the regular edition plus all of the, you know, plus you have the digital exclusive and then you have the, and it's, it's one of those yep. things where it is not cool in my estimation. It, you know, everybody wants it. And so to whoever it was, that made it available. Bless you. Thank you. You yeah. you've done the Lord's work. It was really cool to watch. Yes. yes. So, John, I guess all in all, uh, you know, we kind of talked a little bit of our overall at the beginning, but you know, kind of getting through the the extras here, if you had a rating for them maybe out of like 5 or 10, uh, do you do you have a thought process of where you'd kind of put this on that type of scale? Well, I've been thinking about for the documentary because inevitably it's going to be something I can rate on Letterboxd. What's difficult for me is that I think that it's well put together. I think that its obsession with showing old footage undercuts it. I think that there are some flaws with it. So it probably lands on its own somewhere in the three to three and a half star range. I'm not quite settled on that yet. Overall, with these extras, since I can include seeing the Meisters finale, since I can include seeing a final alliance, since I can include X, Y, and Z, I mean, I, you know, I would give the extras probably a solid four overall just because they gave me what I want, which is process and thinking and that type of thing. What about you? I, I'm right there with you. I think it's a, an absolute four out of five. I mean, I think this is a, uh, you know, if you're wrapping up the Skywalker saga, you know, this is definitely more of a home run when it comes to the extras. And I'm just so happy that, you know, this is what we got. Uh, you know, a, as in um, the thought process behind the film. And um, I, I give the documentary itself, I gave it four out of five, but I took away that whole star because of what you talked about. Uh, and so, you know, it's just disappointing that that was the way it decided to go with with maybe undercutting itself a little bit. Um, but I've seen it twice and I've really enjoyed watching it. And I think part of this, um, and I think one of the, th the helpful things about extras for films is it helps you appreciate the movie more. Even if you don't love the movie, if you get good extras that help you give an insight to the thought process of the creators, the thought process of the writers, the thought process of the actors, the, and, and you kind of get uh, give us an opportunity to see the personalities of the people as well, I think that's the thing that I really love uh, is that it helps me l enjoy the movie more regardless of how I feel about the overall movie just because I've spent time with the people behind the scenes. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of love and care that go into this. We were talking about right before we started recording, one of the moments that I really appreciate about the documentary is the moment where they're filming Ray at the homestead, and she says, you know, I'm Ray, Ray Skywalker. And they hold on that moment, and they cut, and like Daisy's wiping her eyes because she's crying. Um, JJ is crying. You know, he's like, "Come on, guy!" Like he's he's trying to make fun of the fact that he's you know it's dusty out there, right? Uh, but that that kind of thing is the thing that lets you know, regardless of how you feel about these people or the like, they care a lot, mm -hmm. and they're putting their heart and soul into these things. Because as you know, Nick Anastasio said to us before, nobody sits around and makes wants to make a bad movie. Mm -hmm. You know, um, their goal is to make the absolute best movie they can, and so I think that this this series of extras really allows us to get uh, into these people's heads, to spend time with them in a way that is really beneficial, and I think it it makes the movie a, a better experience just for having uh, allowed us to spend more time with them. Yeah, agree. 
Agree. So if people... Well, with that soliloquy done, John, uh, (laughs) where can uh, maybe people find you if they want to catch up with you and talk to you in this crazy time that we're in uh, and see what else you've got going on? Well, you can reach out to me online. Uh, My username is Kessel Junkie. Uh, Honestly, I I enjoy being on Letterboxd more than any other social network. So you can look for me there, uh, you know, offering uh, pithy reviews of different things. I, I do lurk on Twitter here and there, too. I'm working on a behind-the-scenes thing right now for the nerd party that's going to drop this summer, but, uh, oh, no, I've said too much already. And other than that, I mean, you know, just send up the bat signal, and I'll swing in from Gotham or something like that. But, uh, Matt, where can people find you? Well, uh, you could find me on Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, Vero, under the name Matt Rushing 2 uh, I'm also here on the network doing Owl Post or Dre of Kaufman as we're talking through Harry Potter each and every week, one chapter at a time. Although uh, we are almost done already now with the Half-Blood Prince. We've got just a couple chapters left with that. And then we're diving into the final book. So I hope you'll join us. Uh, Two shows over on the Trek FM network. One is called The Orb. I do that with Chris Jones. We talk about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Uh, We just had a brand new episode come out recently. We had a lot of fun, so check that out. Uh, You can find me doing the 602 Club, which is our general geek show. Uh, We're talking about all of the fandoms we love. In fact, you know, uh, John graces us with his presence every once in a while. It's a lot of fun. He, wink, wink, may be coming up in a few weeks, too, so you might want to check that out. Uh, And then last but not least, doing cinema stories with my good friend Courtney as we talk through films, but through the lens of faith. But John, I'm uh, I'm getting that communique from the temple that it's time for us to return uh, and maybe close these negotiations. Well, all right, fine, Matt. Negotiations are closed. Join the revolution. Join the nerd party.